Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. Thank you for joining me as always. This episode features Thomas Ricketts, CFA. Episode came about because somebody at Tom's firm listens to the show. Shout out to you. Pinged me, said, hey, I work for somebody that focuses on innovation investing. I thought to myself, self, I'm a little skeptical of this. But I said, you know what? Send over some info. Let me read. Let me see whether or not I think Tom is legit. They sent. I read. I liked what Tom had to say in writing. I said, I would like to talk to Tom. Tom came on the show. I like talking to Tom. I think you'll enjoy this episode. I hope you'll enjoy this episode. And, you know, I really appreciate the way that Tom thinks. Perfectly candid, innovation investing had me skeptical, as I said. And, you know, it's nice to talk to somebody who's thoughtful that's uh, trying to make money for his investors in the right way. I think, uh, you know, Tom talks about his mentor and it's a... Heartwarming is the best way that I know how to say it. I think it sounds like he had a really good mentor, and I think Tom's out there trying to do his best as well. So what more can you ask for from a guest? I really appreciate him saying yes. Episode-specific disclaimer. Discussions in this program do not constitute investment advice and represent the opinions and personal recollections of Thomas Ricketts. Investors should obtain and read up-to-date investment services material before appointing an investment advisor. The discussion of particular investments or companies is not intended to represent a past or current specific recommendation to purchase or sell a security and should be considered in the context of an overall portfolio. Y'all should know that. Any specific portfolio holdings identified and described do not represent all of the securities purchased, sold, or recommended for evolutionary tree advisory clients. There is no assurance that any securities discussed will remain in the portfolio or that securities sold have not been repurchased. Investing in equity securities involves risk and principal loss is possible. Past performance does not guarantee future results. That is a legit disclaimer, folks. All right, on to the sponsorship. This episode is sponsored by Stratosphere.io. S-T-R-A-T-O-S-P-H-E-R-E dot I-O. Stratosphere.io is a web-based terminal that has financial data, KPIs, links to filings, hedge fund letters, and much more. Stratosphere.io provides clean segment data to go along with the KPIs. Everything's triple checked for accuracy. I think the interface is slick. I've enjoyed doing uh, comparative analyses on uh, different companies within the product. Stratosphere saves users like myself time and enables easy comparisons between companies and offers company-specific metrics, such as subscriber counts, numbers of locations, etc. If you are using the product and you happen to stumble upon a company that doesn't have KPIs, ping my man Braden or his team. They are very quick and responsive. Head over to stratosphere.io for a free trial. Should you want to sign up for a paid offering, please use the promo code BREW, B-R-E-W, for 15% off. As always, none of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. Enjoy the show. Straight from the Brewster Christmas headquarters and Tom Ricketts' actual office. Uh, I apologize to anyone on YouTube that sees the state of my office. Uh, It should be like this for approximately seven more days. Anyway, uh, Tom from Evolutionary Tree... I am. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you, man. I I have uh, had people that have wanted me to have sort of a forward leaning, uh, innovative discussion, and uh, you're somebody that I'd like to have it with. So I appreciate you saying yes. Well, Bill, thank you very much. It's an honor to be on your podcast and show. So we'll keep it conversational. I've got my own Christmas packing to do. So uh, you know, we got to get at it. There, we got to help Santa, don't we? Yeah, well, and I was, I, I'm sorry we were supposed to do this last week. I was completely floored. The flu, flu A went through this family, uh, and it didn't stop until it took all of us down. So thank you for, uh, you know, rescheduling. It was bad. Anyway, if you have any uh, innovative companies that cure the flu, you let me know. Uh, I know we get flu shots, but I'm looking for the real cure. I'd put sure. a lot of money in that. Do you want to describe uh, your background and and where you're from 
and uh, then we'll get into how evolutionary tree began and uh, kind of get into the conversation. Yeah, it sounds great. So I'm I'm from the D.C. area, grew up in the city, I moved out to Virginia, and uh, had the good fortune of working at Sands Capital based in Arlington, Virginia, and I was there. 22 years, so a good part of my 27 going on 28 year career of investing in in growth stocks uh, on the public side. And uh, so I started that firm in 1994 and was there for 22 years. So I can, you want to hear more about my various roles there or, or jump into the firm or? No, yeah. I'd lo- I, you know, I, I think it's fascinating. And then uh, I know you took some time off, uh, refer to it as a sabbatical. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you've evolved uh, as an investor and, and what your time there did to sort of solidify some of your beliefs and then uh, what your sabbatical did to view how you launched this firm. Well, there's no question that my career starting at Sands was very formative for me, particularly working with Frank Sands Sr., my mentor. You know, I really got to work at his side for two decades, uh, which is kind of an incredible thing, given that he's one of the greatest investors of our time. We did recently lose Frank Sands Sr., uh, one of the great ones. So I actually just wrote a blog post recently. I'm going to post to the website that talks about kind of five points of wisdom from one of the wise men of investing. So I'm going to put that out there and we can sort of touch on that if interested. But Yeah, it'd be awesome. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I started the firm when it was, you know, really a, a startup investment firm. It was four people managing less than $100 million. And I was one of the four, a uh, pretty junior guy in, in the early 90s, as you might imagine. Uh, I started out as a generalist analyst covering a bunch of different growth industries. Got my CFA kind of partway through that process and was promoted research analyst. And did that for the better part of a decade, covering technology, consumer, financials, uh, healthcare, you name it. So, you know, really great kind of learning ground for analyzing different business models and in different industries and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And then midway through my career, I built out the global life sciences team at Sands Capital. So that was really diving more deeply into a highly technical sector of kind of healthcare and life sciences, you know, think biotech and med tech and uh, et cetera. What was that like when uh when you go from being kind of a generalist to uh hey here's life sciences good luck? <laughs> it's like learning Russian, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's terrifying to me to think about. You know, I, I had been covering life science companies for a while. You know, pharmaceutical companies, and you through osmosis, uh, you know, kind of pick up the lingo and, and get more comfortable analyzing. Uh, you know, different diseases and treatment modalities, and you get introduced to medical conferences. So you kind of walk your way into it, and then you kind of realize, well, I actually know a little bit, maybe to be dangerous. But uh, in building out the life science sector team, it was really about going deep and really getting technical. So it was moving from going to investor conferences where you hear management teams talk about their exciting technologies to actually getting into the ecosystems of physicians treating patients, going to medical conferences, reading medical journals, uh, and the like. And there's quite a territory to cover there, but if you focus in on areas of growth and innovation, which is really what we did, you can narrow that down. And so some of the more promising growth areas were obviously pharmaceuticals, but kind of biotech was kind of coming of age in the, the mid to late 90s. Um, you know, genetic sequencing was starting to kind of hum a little bit. And we had the, you know, the human genome project. And so I, I kind of saw that industry and, and the broader life science space really broaden out and was there during the early days as that happened. So it was kind of an incredible time period to be covering that. But by the time I fully built out the life science sector team, we were overseeing about $5 billion in investments in life sciences. So we had built oh, out- wow quite a team um, and and I'm, I'm proud of I'm proud of the team actually and, and what they've gone on to do uh, but then I transitioned out of that role into being a co-decision maker on one of the flagship strategies the sands capital select growth strategy which is about a 20 billion dollar strategy when I was co-leading that um, as a co-pm I did that for eight years and and proud that we added significant value over that 
that eight year period. And then in the last few years, concurrent with that, I was working with a couple other professionals to oversee the 40 person global investment team. So over that 22 year period at Sands, a ton of work on being a research analyst and how to do that, portfolio manager, building and managing portfolios, and then uh, also on the management side. Something that, uh, you know, when I, so I listened to your uh, podcast with, um, I want to say Jeremy Schwartz, uh, the Wharton um, Behind the Markets pod, and, you know, looking through the writings that you sent me, um, you know, something that I, I, my initial reaction was like, okay, this is, may not be a very valuation focused investment strategy. And then I was looking at, uh, you have like eight pillars of an investment and you have valuation as a specific, uh, pillar, right? Um, yes. So I know that, you know, traditional like PE and next 12 months and, and whatnot are not, uh, the way to look at these companies, but, what I don't know is the more nuanced questions behind the valuation of these companies. So I'd be, you know, kind of curious, we're coming through uh, a period where valuations in general have gotten uh, kneecapped uh, relative to where they were. I, I suspect, I mean, you've got industrials that and oil and whatever that hasn't, but in this sector, at least, I suspect it's traded off quite a bit. Do you mind talking a little bit about uh, where innovation might potentially uh, be undervalued by the market in in what I think you might argue is a persistent fa fashion, but maybe you may not go that far? Yeah, so um, I can certainly do that. I would always kind of preface it with I'm not making any specific recommendations, but I can certainly share areas where we see underappreciation, undervaluation. I like to actually say right now, for quality innovative companies, you know th that's the new value. I mean, growth, quality growth, quality innovation, and we can define that. Hopefully, we get that during our conversation. Offers great value right now, and, and of course, we're talking in December 2022, kind of after about a year or so of quite a bear market for growth and innovation stocks, really kind of kicked off by the Fed tightening in response to inflation. So, and so valuation is, let me start with this, valuation is critically important. So we have built what I describe as a risk managed approach to investing in innovation. Uh, I also like to describe us as being anti-hype. We are fervently anti-hype. So again, hopefully that comes out. How do you define that? How do you avoid hype? Critical question. Um, I, I started my career at a growth manager investment manager, and growth is an important dimension, but so is valuation or value. And so, you know, one of the things I like to say is growth and value is two styles have been in style and have been around for decades for a reason, because they're two classic, timeless dimensions of investing. The best value managers find growth and earnings power. Maybe it's a rebound. Maybe it's longer term, a la Buffett. And the best growth managers are deeply respectful of valuation discipline. Yeah. And so I'm of that cut of that cloth. Um, what I have found is, and we'll get back to your valuation question and opportunity, is there's a third dimension in the economy, in the markets, and that's innovation. And so hopefully we can build that out a little bit. But we combine all of those. We're looking for quality, innovative businesses that can sustain growth. Innovation, by the way, is the driver and root cause of growth. So we look for that first because you only get paid on future growth. You don't get paid on past growth. So identify important innovations that can sustain growth in a quality manner. And then don't, don't overpay for that. So these are, we have eight investment criteria that you alluded to. You call it the eight pillars. We call it our eight investment criteria. And number eight is valuation. We're looking for a logical valuation based on long-term drivers and economics. We care a ton about unit economics. What I have found is when you're investing in innovative businesses, is you think in terms of the industry life cycle curve, and I'm using my hand to kind of show that life cycle of an industry kind of you know, growing slowly and then hits an inflection point and accelerates and goes up the growth part of the curve and then it matures and then it declines. That, that kind of, call it, they call it an S curve. And 
as you go down that S curve, as you're finding these emerging innovators, not all of them are profitable. What we care about is we're looking for businesses that either are profitable or are on a very clear path to profitability, where the long-term unit economics are highly, highly attractive, meaning typically high relative growth and operating margins, uh, ultimately high returns on capital, and a sustainable, durable business, one that is defendable with moats. We call them innovation moats, which we can kind of hopefully get to. So back to your question, and it was a long, it's a long way to no, answer your question. No, this is good. This is good. But, but I want to set the stage. A uh, bit. We don't do short answers here. We actually have like the conversation. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I, I, then, then I'm like the perfect guest for you. <laughs> good. Well, this is why we got two hours. So let's go. Yeah. Um, so what, what we have seen clearly is evaluations have pulled back a ton over the past year. I would say the first part of that was. Perhaps we got a, a bit extended last year. I don't think you can not start an answer to that question and not give a nod to valuations got extended during 2020 and 2021. But I think what we see with the markets is just like they overshoot on the upside, they can at times overshoot on the downside. And, and I differentiate between kind of two buckets of companies. There's high quality companies that have competitive advantages that are highly innovative and strong balance sheets which are quality, and then lower quality companies, many of which have come public recently. We had a tremendous number of companies that IPO'd or came via SPAC that, in my opinion, are pretty low quality businesses. They're, in some cases, just kind of features or point products. They're subscale. They may never become profitable. Those stocks have pulled back a lot, and they may not rebound. So I, I, I do want to caveat and start with that. But if you separate those out, and the eight investment criteria or pillars, to use your word, is really meant to separate the wheat from the chaff, to separate out the lower quality and really zero in on the higher quality, durable innovators. And for those, it's like the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater. And, and that often happens with the markets, you know, when they're moving up really high, there's kind of everything, all boats lift, and then all boats go down when the tide goes out. But you know we're finding quality biotech companies, quality software as a service or cloud companies, quality e-commerce companies. These are areas where they're getting pretty washed out. Um, you know, as maybe we'll dive down quickly into a handful of kind of examples. In biotech, we've seen we saw a situation maybe six or nine months ago where there were literally hundreds of biotech companies that were trading for less than cash on the balance sheet. Yeah. I remember that. So that's like a cigar butt biotech style. Um, although they burn through the cash, so maybe they deserve to be there. So that's another conversation. We don't invest in those kind of biotech companies. Um, but it, but it, when that happened, it pulled on a lot of the higher quality biotech companies where maybe they have FDA approved drugs generating revenues. They're growing rapidly. They've got pretty big pipelines. They've got billions of dollars on the balance sheet. That's a quality biotech. You've reduced your binary risk, your self-funding off the balance sheet. You've got validated technology platforms. These are among many elements we look for. And those valuations, were, we had one biotech company that in July of this year was trading at a valuation. You could essentially buy the entire pipeline for free. Hmm. So just the value of the three FDA approved drugs that that biotech had, that was equivalent to the current market cap. It's since moved higher by about 40 to 50 percent. So we're starting to see some of these quality biotechs bounce off what could be in retrospect a bottom. We don't know for sure, but I suspect that's possible. And the reason for that is investors are starting to realize that healthcare in particular is perhaps more insulated from the coming recession that everyone's been talking about for weeks now, if not months. So I do think healthcare is an area that uh, offers, um, I don't want to say safety, I never use that word, but it yeah. offers a little bit of a safer haven. I'll use that word. In, in, a, in a difficult kind of global economic environment. But I think biotech in particular still hasn't fully recovered. If you look at the larger pharma companies, they've now moved up in earnest. They're, they're now at kind of five and 10 year kind of reversion to mean averages. But quality biotech uh, has a ways to go. So that would be a good example. E-commerce 
is very washed out. Amazon is a quick example, is now trading such that at least according to our sum of the parts calculation, you can buy Amazon for the value of just AWS, which is their Amazon Web Services cloud computing business and get the whole e-commerce business for free. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the quality biotech six months ago. Um, so I'll kind of pause there, but we, we are indeed seeing uh, pretty big pockets of areas of innovation where the valuations for the quality companies are quite compelling. Um, so we, we are kind of leaning in incrementally uh, to some of those more compelling opportunities. I think Amazon is, uh, you know, maybe a, a good place to frame some of the conversation because it's so easy for most of us to understand how much innovation is going on in that company. Um, you know, one thing I heard you say uh, is you can invest in 30 innovative companies, but you're really, you have, uh, you know, you could have up to 80 in different innovations and, and maybe I'm not completely quoting you correctly there, but I think Amazon's a good example of one company, but look, think of all the innovation that's going on within it. One of the things that uh, can get people talking past each other when you're talking about a company like Amazon, and I, and I think it probably applies to a fair amount of these companies, how do you think through, and I, I know there's not a right answer, but I'm just kind of curious to hear you riff on uh, either the answer or how you'd put the answer together. Um, how do you think through like what spend is necessary to uh, sort of like almost like a maintenance innovation spend versus like what is just growthy and sort of wasteful and uh, and or a, a byproduct of the innovation product like like process. One of the things that's difficult for me to figure out is like what do these companies actually look like uh, once all of the the running of, of SGNA sort of like right sure. sizes. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. You're getting at, look, a lot of these, particularly as larger mega cap tech companies uh, have really been, I don't want to say spending like drunken sailors, but they've been investing very aggressively, hiring tons of software engineers. They have these moonshots. That's kind of the, the Google term. Uh, investing in a lot of things that perhaps may not pay off for a decade or may never pay off. Um, you know, on Amazon, we found out, I found out recently that they were spending apparently $5 billion on Alexa and really developing that to target lots of different use cases and be kind of embedded in more and more products in the home in kind of Amazon's push to dominate the smart home. And, and they're doing a phenomenal job with that, by the way. But I think that dynamic of leaning in and using the profits from kind of the core business, which is really what you're trying to get at. What's the profitability of the core business? Yeah. And what supports that relative to all these moonshot things that maybe mask that underlying profitability? And I think what's maybe more exciting or positive for a company like Amazon is they're the quintessential example of what we just described. They spent the better part of 15 to 20 years taking every profitability that they were generating from the core e-commerce business and building out AWS, building out their digital advertising business, and continually pushing out showing profitability. And, and yet we know inherently they have a very profitable uh, AWS business. They have now obviously disclosed that and you can see that it is a very profitable business, but that doesn't mean they haven't stopped investing in multi-billion dollar investments, a la the Alexa one we just mentioned. And I think we are entering an environment right now where investors en masse are demanding every single company, show me the path to profitability. This growth at all costs, no mas. And so I do think management teams are responding. Uh, Amazon being a very good example of that. They clearly have come out and said, we are reevaluating our investments. I imagine they're probably going to cut the Alexa investment who knows, in half or more. We know Google's doing that at Alphabet. We know Microsoft's doing that. And I think it's actually a pretty big positive that kind of it's happening all at once, that all the big mega cap tech companies, which have been kind of jockeying with each other, all together are reining in those, those over-investment horns. And the question is, back to your original question, how do you peel back that onion and figure out what the profitability is. What we do know is 
that if you take an alphabet, for example, their core search business is probably one of the most profitable businesses on the planet. You know, the incremental margins are close to, you know, 100%. They're just very high. Uh, let's call it visa-like margins, perhaps. Amazon, there's no reason, in my opinion, that Amazon can't be uh, have comparable profitability to a Walmart, for example, or a Target. Um, if you remember, Amazon has their Prime subscription, uh, which helps to defray a lot, a lot of the costs that relate to obviously streaming, but you know logistics and fulfillment costs that they have. They've raised the price on that, so they have pricing power. We also know that Amazon on the e-commerce side is actually three different businesses. It's the first party business, i.e. they sell their own inventory. The third party business, which is a marketplace model, which is generally higher margin, and it's been mix shifting towards third party. And then the advertising business, which we know is very high margin. So you can kind of see the mix shift within Amazon's e-commerce side of the house, mix shifting towards higher margin businesses, third party and advertising. And as they pull back some of this unnecessary overinvestment, I think over the next year that that can be revealed. If you go back in time, they've had these periods of massive investment and then they slow the investment and then they start to reveal that kind of latent profitability and the stock can react quite positively. So perhaps, again, I'm not guaranteeing this, but perhaps we're entering that period of pulling back over investment, revealing some of the underlying latent profitability. I think that's a huge positive. Now the markets aren't reacting that way. They're, they're penalizing companies as we kind of go into this difficult economic environment. But I think if you're willing to look out over a longer time frame, which is what we do, looking at over the next three, five, seven years, um, there's a lot of positive profit drivers embedded within within Amazon. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think um I think, you know, beyond Amazon, like uh you know, I saw I saw you own uh Encino um or did in your last quarterly earnings. We, uh, we do recall. still do. Uh, you know, I study Guidewire. Those two things kind of rhyme, right? They both kind of software solution for niches. Um, but I guess that I'm pretty sure this characterizes both those. Uh, maybe not as well as um. I, there's probably better examples, but these high gross margin businesses that have low operating income, like to me, it's almost like objectively true that there's too much SG&A bloat when you look at what a lower margin business can do. Uh, and and what they can can generate from lower gross margins to operating margins, right? There should, in theory, to me, be some SGNA to take out of a business, but there is some of, some of the the innovators. I think it's almost like embedded in the business. So so decoupling yes. what is uh, you know necessary to keep an innovation culture. And then also uh, what is theoretically possible to return to shareholders or the company itself. Like thinking through that, I find to be a, a difficult uh, puzzle to solve. I, I think you have a key insight there, which is if you find innovative businesses that have high gross margins, that's a great starting point because you've got a lot of your starting point for profitability is you have high price relative to the cost to support that product or service. And that means that if you can gain SG&A leverage, R&D leverage over time, you have a, a glide path or a pathway to deliver strong expansion of net margins and probably higher earnings growth than top line growth. Yes. But the company has to deliver on that. And so that's where a lot of the research comes in. So we do a lot of research to really tease that out. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe I'll use Encino as yeah. a quick example. Now, I can't guarantee that Encino is going to deliver what I'm going to describe for you, but I think there's a lot of good potential. So Encino, for your listeners, just very briefly, is what I like to call one of the most boring innovators doing something exciting as an investment. So what do I mean by that? First off, not every innovation has to be exciting. You can innovate in an area that needs you know, cost reduction or improvement in productivity. And Sino targets, just so people know, is a cloud software application company for the banking industry, for financial service companies. They started out with what's called a loan origination system. Uh, it's a cloud loan origination system to digitize the workflow of underwriting a loan and interacting with different players and 
being able to approve that, et cetera. Um, probably one of the more unsexy parts of a bank, but really critical, as we all know, and very paper intensive and documentation intensive, uh, thank goodness, post great financial crisis. And so I think you mentioned the word niche. Uh, I think what's exciting about Encino is what I think they're targeting is not a niche. It's actually a multi-billion dollar market because they target global banks of all sizes, whether it's a local community bank, a midsize, a regional, or kind of what are called enterprise size banks that are kind of national level um, or even bigger. And they've got customers not just across the US, but Encino has been winning banks uh, in Europe, in France, in the UK, in Germany, in parts of Asia, including Japan. So we're talking about uh, and kind of the, the class of company that we're referring to is what are, what's called vertical cloud applications. So vertical meaning industry specific cloud application platforms. I think this is an underfollowed area of the market. You mentioned Guidewire. We don't own Guidewire, but they're a good example of that. Uh, but Encino appears to be almost a de facto dominant leader in this space. They're built on top of the Salesforce, force.com platform. So they've got built-in scalability uh, and compliance and security. Um, they spent the better part of a number of years building out a full suite. In fact, they, they call their, their bank cloud application platform the bank operating system. And so they can go in and help digitize a lot of these manual-based workflows. They're replacing anywhere from 10 to 20 different individual applications that are often either client server based or in some cases mainframe based which is just insane to think about and so you know they have what's called a land and expand motion where they'll land with one application and then they'll, they'll add seats to that and then they'll add another application and again fill out that full bank operating system this is a business that probably has a decade of well above average top line growth and then as you alluded to, you know, it's a business with high operating or high, high gross margins. They just hit profitability this recent quarter. Uh, they're guiding to 10% operating margins next year. So they're demonstrating, yes, we can deliver profits. And oh, by the way, we think we can actually show that leverage that you were describing. So I'll pause there. But Encino is a great example of a business that you can catch earlier on the S-curve addressing a large global market has clear competitive advantages and a moat, um, and is frankly pretty early. I don't know if you heard of a company called Viva, Viva yeah, Systems. I've, yeah, people have, they, they're, yeah. Yeah, they do the same thing on the kind of the, the life science side, uh, built on top of the, the Salesforce force platform. They have, they show the playbook of expanding margins over a decade as they win and they do the land expand motion. So you ought to be able to get a fair amount of sg &A leverage. So I'll stop there. I know it's probably more in the weeds on Encino, but what a great example of what, what we're talking about. And it's undervalued in our opinion. Why, um, I, I, the reason Viva came up is a couple of the software guys that I know I pinged because I read that Encino was built on this, on the soft, uh, the Salesforce platform. And I wondered whether or not that created a vulnerability within sort of Encino's ecosystem. And I pinged a couple people with that question and they said, well, Viva is too. And Viva is probably the best run SaaS company to take a look at, uh, you know, if you want kind of a, what things could be. Um, so why does it not create a vulnerability? It seems like you, you end up with like a single supplier uh, potential issue. Um, and Salesforce may need to exercise pricing power in the not too distant future to keep people happy. Yeah, I think Salesforce wants a healthy ecosystem on their force.com platform. So if they mistreat Viva or Encino, and they have hundreds of partners that have built applications on top of force.com, I, I don't think it would be healthy for their ecosystem to, to gouge their their partners. So I, I think it's a pretty healthy ecosystem, actually. Um, they help each other. So there's synergy. If Encino sells their bank operating system into a bank, then they can co-sell the Salesforce CRM platform alongside what Encino is doing. So they're, it's, they're really positive partners selling mm -hmm. each other's uh, uh, services and platforms together. Yeah, that makes All sense. All that said, you know, Viva Viva has kind of co-sourced. They work with AWS, so they've they're actually in the process of moving a fair amount of their 
platform over to AWS. So they're kind of replatforming. Um, and so Encino has that potential. They've got their analytics uh, software actually built on AWS. Okay. So, you know, if, if longer term they had to second source or move a number of applications, they, they can do that. I, I don't think they necessarily need to do that um, because I think they're actually working fairly well together. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, like a, like a shark and a small fish, you can have symbiosis, right? Uh, it exists. So, yeah. um, well, I, well, Encino, by the way, is a shark in what they do. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're selling an on-prem client server, a mainframe bank application, the Encino shark is coming for you. There you go. It's a big market. Uh, if you're listening now, you're on notice. Do you want to define quality innovators? You said that you wanted to uh, to go back to that, and I know that you you yeah. lean into the concept of uh, of quality. Uh, I want to say as a margin of safety, but I don't want to misquote you. But I like that concept. I've I've yeah. uh, as I've gotten older, I've appreciated that more and more. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that we're known for is is not just being a specialist in innovation investing, but that we're we've really carved out more of a focus on quality innovation. So what what is that? Uh, really our eight investment criteria define that. So I, I'm going to touch on that. But if you don't mind, let me define innovation first. Uh, sometimes we get asked the question, hey, Tom, is innovation the same as technology? And the answer is no. Innovation does not equal technology. Technology is one form of innovation. So I kind of define innovation as profound innovation driven by new products and new services supported by new business models that create significant value for users. And you kind of see that when it drives an evolutionary shift from an old way of doing things to a new way, or from an old generation to a next generation offering. That to me is you know important innovation. And there's kind of two buckets of innovation. There's technology innovations. So yes, there are technology innovations like software and technology hardware innovations and semiconductors and software. There's technology platforms, which are kind of enabling technology innovations. Um, most people think of innovation as kind of being in that bucket, but we define innovation more broadly for lots of reasons. One, we see innovation well beyond technology. Uh, there's a lot of non-technology innovation. I, I kind of alluded to boring innovation. Uh, there's organizational innovation, there's business model innovation, there's process or cost innovation, there can be service or experience innovation, there's brand and marketing innovation. Uh, really what I find is the great innovators of our time combine both technology and non-technology innovation. So you think of an Apple, you know, Apple is a great brand. They have design innovation. They have experience innovation. When you go to their stores, they have the Genius Bar. They obviously have a lot of great kind of embedded hardware innovation in their smartphones or the iPhone. A lot of software. They've got cloud and service innovation. So the more of these innovations you kind of bring together in your offering, the more differentiated you get, uh, which I think creates, you know, a lot of pricing power. Um, so we define innovation really pretty broadly. Again, tech and non-tech innovation. Remind me again, Bill, of, of what I was driving towards here. Oh, I, you, we were going to get to the definition of a quality innovator. Yeah. So, so again, quality is based on certain features that a business has, certain characteristics. So we, we embody a lot of that in our eight investment criteria. Maybe I'll go through those quickly if you don't mind, uh, and that way it really kind of builds out in a more robust way. Yeah, a good so, way to frame everything. Bill, one of the things that I found in my 27, 28 years of investing is there's kind of three really basic ingredients of a successful investment. One, you picked an attractive industry and you got in early and you wrote it for many years. Two, you picked the leader of that industry and you stuck with it. And then three, you didn't overpay. So you, you got in at an attractive entry point where it didn't fully discount that growth and leadership, and you exited before maturity. Those are the three building blocks of a successful investment. And so when I kind of apply that to innovation, what I find is, you know, an attractive industry is going to be, you know, one where that industry is undergoing a lot of innovation. There's innovative things happening new software, new hardware, new features, new business models being created that are very meaningful for users. Uh, that's kind of the first element we look for. Second element is 
we want really large markets. I mean, not every area of innovation generates a multi-billion dollar market like one that we see for an Encino or what we've already seen with Amazon. So large markets, and this is what key phrase is, we're looking for room for growth. We call it RFG. Uh, we don't want to embrace uh, a growth or area of innovation where we're in the eighth inning or the latter part of that growth part of the curve. We really want to make sure that the next five, 10 years or, or even longer, there's a lot of runway. So in Encino, for example, I think is in the very early innings of a decade plus build out. Um, so room for growth. And then third, and this is a quality element as well, is an industry that is evolving down a less competitive path. I mean, industry has basically evolved down two paths, either a highly competitive path. And by the way, most industries are like that, 10, 20, 30 competitors, whittling down margins, whittling down returns. That's not an attractive long-term investment. Or they evolve down a less competitive path what we like to call an opoly path. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Monopoly, duopoly, and oligopoly, where you have a winner-take-most dynamic, uh, dominant leaders can emerge. Those tend to support higher margins and returns. And that's quality. Uh, a lot of companies have been brought public over the past 12, 18 months where they're in highly competitive industries where they don't have very attractive business models. Um, at the company level, and I'll, I'll try and breeze through this, uh, we're looking no, for- No, no, th please don't don't feel like you got to breeze through anything. I, I enjoy the long conversations because I, I think there's so much art in investing that a lot of gold comes out. Like something that you said twice that I think is really interesting that you just covered on is, uh, you know, exiting before maturity. And, uh, and, then, and then you said something else about maturity, which I'm curious to follow up on. But like that doesn't happen if if we're just talking fast, right? So please, I mean, feel free to to go on. We'll come back to that, and and I appreciate you you allowing me to expand on these ideas because I agree with you. There's an art and a science, and every firm is combining those elements, um, and it's hopefully they're being thoughtful about their process. So again, eight criteria. I hit on the first three, which relate to an attractive industry, but then at that, you know, I mentioned you want to pick the industry leader. And of course, everyone wants an industry leader. I mean, I'm not saying anything that other firms aren't saying, but but let me give you a difference. And that is the companies that are out innovating the competitors, they're the future industry leader. So we want to dive into what are they innovating? What's it, we call it the innovation pipeline. What are the new products, services, features? What are they working on in, in the lab? And we talk to former employees. We talk to users. We'll go to the user conference where the company management team talks. These are all the exciting things we're going to have on our roadmap. We care about the roadmap. And so uh, that's quality. When you have a company investing in innovation that may not launch for three years, that to me is quality. It might not be valued in the market. It's not being valued right now. But I can tell you three years from now when they launch that innovation, it will be valued. So we're looking for who's out innovating the competitors, and we really dive in on that at a pretty detailed level. Then we're looking for competitive advantage. You know, people talk about economic moat. Again, everyone's looking for the economic moat. I think the key word is layers. We are gone from the age where if you had one competitive advantage, you know, you could ride that for a decade or two decades. Those days are over. If you have a strong brand, great. If that's all you have, you're toast. So what do we mean by that? We mean you need to have a combination of these elements, strong brand, scale advantages, distribution advantages. We love the technology advantages of switching costs, lock-in, network effect. Again, the more advantages you combine, the wider your moat. Relying on one, not enough. Uh, and that adds a lot of quality, you know, and innovation, by the way, enables you to widen your moat. So they're actually linked. If you're more innovative, I mean, the things that Apple are doing is so innovative, it's hard for anyone to keep up with what they're doing. That's a competitive advantage. It's speed of innovation is, itself is a competitive advantage. Beyond that, very much the quality of the business model. We touched on that. What's the latent unit economics of the industry and the business? Are they demonstrating that path? Are they making progress on that path? You know, we love the fact that a company like an Encino is saying, look, we get it. We need to show profitability. Uh, we're going to start to show leverage for you. Luckily, they built out their product platforms. So they don't necessarily have to keep investing and not showing profits. They're at that point where they can 
they can show the leverage. We also care a lot about the balance sheet. I've lived through enough bear markets and financial crises. I lived through the dot-com boom bust. I lived through and was an investor during the great financial crisis. I can assure you I'm a balance sheet investor like anyone else. I care a ton about uh, innovative businesses that are very well financed. So what does that mean? It means their balance sheet typically has high relative cash. Uh, they have low or no debt. Maybe they have partners that are kind of working with them, like a biotech company. We own biotechs that have five or six large pharmaceutical companies that are partnered on programs, throwing off milestone or royalty payments. All of these elements improve the financing position of the business to keep building that innovation pipeline that we talked about. It's a subtle thing. It's like no one cares about the balance sheet until they really care, and then it's like too late. So I'm excited, frankly, to go through a more difficult bear and economic environment because it's going to stress the lower quality businesses and investments. And I think it will reveal who was focusing on quality. Um, you know, last thing for the company, how we define quality, this, this is kind of what I describe as one of the secret weapons of long-term investors is not just a focus on the management team, but really a focus on culture. And then are they a talent magnet or not? I call it the triad of management. Management creates culture. Culture attracts talent. Talent is what innovates. And we're beyond a world where the CEO uh, is the dominant person. Sorry. C-suite's important, no doubt. And their capital allocation, other investment decisions are absolutely critical. I'm not trying to discount that. But companies that attract the largest number of engineers and developers or have the smartest people developing a treatment for a particular disease, they're in a great position to out-innovate the competitors. So we, we, we do a lot of things to assess culture. Perhaps we can touch on that a little bit later. Those are all elements that define quality at the company level. And then I don't think you're a quality, innovative investment if your stock's overvalued. So I, I would just start by saying whether it's a great company or a great innovator, they most certainly can become overvalued. And if you're not, if you don't have an attractive IRR, potential rate of return, then that's not a quality, it might be a quality business, but it's not a quality investment. So I'll kind of pause there. I know I kind of jumped on our eight investment criteria and I talked about how we define much more broadly innovation. Um, maybe I'll pause there. Yeah, no, I like it. Uh, you know, I, I come back to uh, one of the things that is, um, you know, it's it's tough until you do the work and then it's probably still tough is just figuring out, you know, how much of the cash flow reinvestment in that year three product or the year four product uh, should it, like how much should you ding or how much should you reward a company for making those those kind of decisions? Because, you know, mathematically, right, a dollar next year is worth it's got to be, I don't know, let's call it a buck 50 or whatever in year three. So for going the profits and then and then to go to get to something bigger, my answer as I've thought more and more about this problem is that um, really, really rich valuations on big bases is probably not a great place to start, generally speaking, like as a bucket. I would think uh, smaller, like companies that are earlier in their life cycle and therefore probably, I don't know, carry somewhere between, I don't know, under a $5 billion valuation, say. that That's something that like in my head, I could say, okay, well, $25 billion to $50 billion valuation, that's like plausible to me, right? If you get to a $20 billion valuation, to get to 200, there are very few companies that ever get there, right? So, uh that's kind of how I I was I was actually just having this conversation in a different way earlier this morning. Um, I would just, if you don't mind me responding, I, I think the the way you described it, that there's kind of a time horizon to a company's investments, and is is a good way to think about it. And and I think there was a, a McKinsey study or something that was done on this, or it was basically making the case that every company should have a portfolio of investments they're making based on time horizon. And it makes sense. If you're a company that's only investing in things that are going to hit in the next year, great. You'll do great over the next 12, 24 months. But if you underinvest in those innovations that are really needed to keep competitive, stay competitive, 
in year three, four, or five, you'll be out competed by your competitors. And then I hate to use the word disruption because I think it's abused. Not every industry is undergoing disruptive innovation. Sorry. But there, is, there are situations that happen from time to time where there is structural architectural change happening within your industry. And you might need to very significantly re-architect what you're doing. And sometimes that can take years. And I mean, I think of Microsoft, you know, Microsoft was so tied to, you know, Windows operating system for PCs and servers. And they had, of course, a suite of applications. And then the cloud comes along and they completely missed the, the smartphone. Totally missed that. But they perhaps learn a lesson in that, that they better not miss the next wave. And the next wave hitting enterprise software was the shift to the cloud. And such and Adela and, and other uh, managers at Microsoft, they didn't miss it. They invested in Azure and it took years, years and years and years of investing to build that out. They had to completely re-architect. They had to actually change their culture from trying to dominate everything to being more open and embracing partners and building an ecosystem. That's very un-Microsoft-like, at least in some regard. And But they'd succeeded in that because they made these multi-year investments and re-architect, re-architecting their business. And they, they're now they're flourishing as a result. I mean, Azure is growing 30% plus. It's a huge company. So I, I think it's very important for innovative businesses to have that portfolio of things they're investing in both near and longer term. But I think where the, the wheel comes off the bus is when they're investing in something that might not come to fruition for 20 years. Um, or where you're just not getting validation or evidence that it's worth continuing to invest. You know, I think right now we're seeing a fair amount of that questioning of investment in things like fully autonomous driving. You know, are we ready for that? It might be another decade before we're ready for that. Um, and, and this kind of touches on the topic of hype and anti-hype. I, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning that we're fervently anti-hype. And in the area of innovation investing, you know, you can find a number of innovation ETFs and kind of offerings that are very kind of thematic and top down. And they're, they're almost, I call them kind of a grab bag of sexy, exciting innovations that on the surface are very interesting. But when you dig down below the hood are, are lower quality businesses that whose technologies and innovations are not ready for prime time. And so we, we have a pretty systematic process where we will look at a, a promising innovation and we'll kind of consider it uninvestable until it proves itself. And so how does an innovation kind of prove itself? It has to kind of basically address two hurdles. That's to show technical feasibility. The innovation works, it's reliable, it's cost effective. Sometimes innovations can take decades of gestation to get to that point where they even have technical feasibility. We're kind of seeing that play out in front of us with fully autonomous driving. When's it technically feasible? Who knows? Second is what I call kind of economic or business model feasibility. You can show an innovation works, but can it generate recurring revenue? Can it create this unit economic model that's highly profitable or not? And so, you know, you can have things kind of thrown at the wall, uh, you know, like the food delivery companies, you know, that, that deliver prepared foods in a box. Like, sure, that works. You can get a box in the mail and you can make your meal, but is that a business model that's going to be profitable? Probably not. Um, so those are the two fundamental hurdles for kind of moving from what I call the hype phase into being ready. And really what we're trying to find that we think is more investable innovation are innovations that are ready for mainstream adoption. And that's technical and economic feasibility. And then even that's not enough where we know that as a new industry is created, and there's a lot of growth. What happens when a, an industry is created and there's a ton of growth? It attracts Lots a of lot competition. of competition. Yeah. Exactly. So competition, and, th and that competition can come from kind of new startups and new entrants. They can come from large companies that say, oh, we got to put a billion dollars on that industry to attack it from our, our source of strength. And so it becomes a, a melee uh, of a ton of competitors that move in. And usually that destroys the industry. Um, but if, if a company has these uh, innovation moats that we call these layers of competitive advantage, 
then it allows a, a true pioneering innovator to emerge as the dominant company. And it can fend off smaller competitors. Perhaps it can fend off some of the larger companies. So we're, we're really looking for all of those elements to come together to create something where the industry is ready, the innovation is ready. There's a standout innovator that meets our eight criteria. Then you're getting into that. It becomes investable. And that, that's a very powerful way of eliminating the lower quality hype that's out there. And there's just a ton of it out there. So um, part of me says, okay, so would you want to wait until uh, it's like polling capitals? Uh, they coined the idea of a moat attack, right? Like, do you want to wait until somebody seems to attack the com- like uh, company that you're invested in? Or uh, the other part of me is like, well, maybe you make the investment um, and you hold off on position size and see how things sort of like uh, develop. And as you get more conviction, you can size up something, even though it's bigger if it's working. And the, it's, you know, the, I, I used to think you got to buy stuff as cheap as possible because that's how you get the least amount of risk. And I could not disagree more than with that. Uh, I think that's a very naive thought. Uh, I, I've lost enough money on cheap stuff to realize that that's a very dumb idea. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Bill, you bring that up because there, there was a book. We, we have a book club. We, we read a blog about it. And it's uh, for value investors. It's called Where the Money Is, Value Investing in the Digital Age. And it's basically touching on I the point I got to interview made. that guy. I, I met him at Markel. He, he was selling yeah, books yeah. there, yeah. Yeah. So here, here's the book, Where Where the Money Is. Yeah. Adam, and yeah. I, he, I think he probably should have... He should, he should pay me a royalty fee for putting up his book. But, yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll hit him up the, for affiliate marketing. Yeah, yeah, we'll send him some email, see if he responds. But um, he, I mean, he should have probably called the book Value 3.0. But the basic idea is, you know, Value 1.0 is a cigar butt approach, you know, kind of like buying a company at less than its value of its assets on the balance sheet, you know, early 1900s style Graham and Dodd type investing. Value 2.0 was really the Buffett approach of focusing on not the margin of error being you're buying below asset value, but you're buying a quality business that has earnings power that's underappreciated and even better, it can grow the earnings power. That's that value 2.0. What this concept is, is just acknowledging that kind of every industry is undergoing a shift to becoming more digital. Every company is becoming more kind of tech enabled to some degree and realizing that perhaps you need to update your toolkit um, you know, trying to apply book value for a software company, not very effective. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I find that pretty interesting. Um, I do feel like we were on a topic before we jumped into, uh, into this book and I, Oh, I don't know. I, I forget I, we were, we were I, you on. know, I, I talk about media with people a lot and, uh, I, I guess the, the example that's in my head to, to demonstrate what I think is I, I have a negative bias and it may be wrong. I'm open to that, but, uh, to Paramount and, and a lot of the times people like a common thing that comes back is valuation and it's like, okay, but if you look at the assets that Paramount has, I, I think CBS is an incredible asset, but like relative to the assets that Disney has or relative to, I mean, even Comcast has a lot of different ways to play this going forward. I, I, uh, I just think that the younger me didn't appreciate to your point, the layers of, of defensibility within businesses and almost how that intersection of, uh, layers can create, um, outcomes where, and create a more durable business franchise. You yes, mentioned and, 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 and how much the bet should be skewed to compensate you, right? Like at a horse race, you need to have a much higher bet skew to bet the long shot than you do the the heavy favorite for that is favored for good reason, right? It's not like oh well, one's three to one and one's ten to one. I should take the ten to one. No, it's like forty to one to verse three to one. Um, it's it's much different. Let me connect your uh, first off. I like the idea of a skewed bet. Uh, or the fat pitch, I guess is another way to describe it, but just the idea that you have kind of planets aligning for an investment or a business that have reduced risk, but it hasn't been discounted, that reduction in risk. And so I remember what we were talking about before, we kind of veered off on the value 3.0, and that was the mode attack. You mentioned Poland and the idea of, um, do you wait for a company to get tested and their competitive advantage to get tested and then they survive and that's kind of like your, your green light? Um, 
We use a similar approach. Uh, we call it risk reducers. We are looking for companies where a lot of things are happening. We want to see the technology and innovation validated in the marketplace. We want to see that it is tested against competition. I mean, one of the, the biggest green lights for me is when a really well-financed dominant company tries to compete with you and fails. I mean, if a Microsoft comes at you and fails, yeah, Disney tried to attack Netflix. And I mean, they're still trying, right? I mean, they'll probably end up doing okay long term. But when, when a smaller emerging innovator is tested and then they come through that with flying colors, boy, is that a buy sign. Um, so I, I like the, the mode attack idea. That's, that's a nice way to describe it. I just describe it as you've been tested and you survive and you're thriving. Um, yeah. Another word that I use is validation. So if I look at a biotech or med tech company, um, I don't want to buy the promise that the drug's going to be effective and you know we think in phase three it'll look great, or that this device you know that we're going to launch three years from now will probably display standard of care. That's not an investment case. What we do is we look at the biotech or med tech. We want to understand the technology platform. Is the technology platform feasible? What what's the body of data that's throwing off? And one of the great things about life science investing is the FDA requires you to generate a ridiculous amount of clinical data, and it's all public. So it's it's presented. Uh, you can access it. It's presented at medical conferences. It's reviewed in journals. You can talk to doctors. I mean, literally, th these are some of the most well evaluated technologies in the world. Uh, but it is technical. And so you have to kind of get in the trenches and the ecosystem. So we talk to doctors, we do survey, we go to medical conferences, and we're looking for, here's the V word, validation. And so we're looking for clear efficacy, superiority. We're looking for uh, hopefully good safety. Uh, oftentimes drugs live or die, not based on efficacy, but on safety. So we look for both. And then we really kind of stand on the shoulders of the users, which are usually the doctors. And doctors, you know, their first kind of call to duty is first do no harm. And so they're gonna tell you the straight skinny, like, yeah, this this treatment is really gonna be highly effective and I'm gonna use it, or it's got some word on it and I'm probably not gonna use it. So we look for data points. We look for feedback from experts and users. We wanna build that body of validation um, and that's pretty effective to kind of reducing risk. I have found in my experience that the markets tend to be delayed in recognizing that, hmm. particularly in the more technical fields. Um, you know, it's biotech or med tech. It, they want ad nauseum type proof. Sometimes they're just waiting until the, the growth has been shown for three years and then they glom onto it, which by the way is, we didn't touch on it, but one of the benefits of focusing on innovation first is you're not chasing growth. Uh, I mean, traditional growth managers are they're kind of their their first step is growth screens. Yeah. What are growth screens? It's companies that have been growing for three to five years historically, and then that's their starting point. Why would you want to start there? Why wouldn't you start with let's find the the root cause of growth, which is innovation. Start there, find innovation going mainstream, and then position yourself ahead of those guys. So that that's the mission, um, and we're not perfect at it, um, but we we are built around identifying these important innovations and hopefully positioning ourselves ahead of traditional growth. And again, this idea of validation, getting into the ecosystem. You know, we talk to bankers, for example, and we talk about Encino and, and they're come back with glowing comments about, it's incredible. I can get loans approved and a reduction in multiple days and I can pull, I can enter information once about you know, a, a business person with a business loan, it's it's in the database. And then every time they come back for a new loan, it's all right there. And I don't have to re-enter information. Like these are, you get feedback and data points from folks in the ecosystem. And it just gives you a lot of validation. That's the conviction. I'm sure you talk to folks that talk about how do you build your visibility and conviction? That's fundamental to our process. I think it's funny because people will probably listen to this and be like, "That's that shouldn't be unique. And as somebody that worked in a bank, I can tell you that's very unique. Now, I, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've speculated that I think that something like Encino and maybe Encino could could uh, wipe out a lot of small and, and medium business uh, underwriters. Uh, commercial, everything we did was on Moody's. Um, 
and I don't know if they're like so ingrained that they're going to be hard to knock out, but man, the amount of different times I had to, to write the same number in a loan approval. I mean, it was crazy. It was like six data entries of the same number. And then of course, if one got transposed, you know, it, it cast a doubt on everything. So, uh, anything that makes that process easier, I am for. Yeah. I, that, that's well, something I could get in, excited about. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, we we want to make it. I mean, the goal is improve worker productivity and eliminate redundancy. And you know, in the banking industry, there's just a lot of moving paper around and collecting information. It's it's a very let's just say it's a very inefficient process. Now, luckily, Encino doesn't compete with you know Moody's or Bloomberg or any of that. I mean, they're they're focused on that workflow of of an underwriter, a banker collecting all this information yeah. for a business loan or otherwise, and then wow. working with other people within the bank. And it's a huge uh, but because market. It's a, it's just a huge, huge market. We were doing bigger, like syndicated stuff. I, I come from commercial banking. Uh, so we, you know, we did like, a, we did a fair amount of, of bigger facilities. So I think you need, it's a little, a yeah. little harder to automate, but I think there's a ton, a ton of potential. Uh, yeah. Uh, to attack that is not that. Yeah. Uh, and probably a lot of uh, potential to attack that is that too. So I got to ask this question. Uh, how do you feel? You know, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is uh, you talk about innovation a lot and you also talk about valuation. And it's so obvious that uh, you have come from a uh, a very professional training ground. And I think if anything, you talk down uh, what, what may be around the corner. How do you feel about certain investors that are innovation focused that are throwing like massive targets out there that might set people's expectations up for, uh, what they may expect you to tell them? Yeah. So again, we're talking about hype and anti-hype and related to that is promotion. And if you're selling an innovation ETF, then you're trying to sell sizzle and excitement and perhaps the kind of research that you're doing and the information you're sharing with potential investors is this company could grow to be 10 times its size and the number of widgets or cars or whatever could be you know really really big number and then they throw out these price targets and i think that does a disservice for kind of the broader innovation style. I mean, I, I personally believe that, again, we started with value in the early 1900s as a dimension of investing. You know, post-World War II was really where kind of growth got kicked off. Of course, growth is important. Of course, growth and earnings power is critical. They're both important. That's why they're not, they're never going away. But now we have innovation. We do live in what I call the age of innovation. It's not to be promotional. It's just, we live in, in a world where software is invading every industry. There's just a ton of enabling technologies that are being used. It's, I think it's frankly an exciting time to be alive. And so talk to anyone in the industry and ask them what they're afraid of. And they'll tell you, I'm afraid of someone, again, there's this word disrupt, disruption, but I am afraid of a company using these different technologies to change the business model and to add value beyond perhaps the way we're doing it. That's real. Everyone lives that. It's just a fact. And so from an investment point of view, we're getting some really good data coming back. There's a lot of academic papers that are coming out that are showing that innovation is really the prime mover of the economy. There, there was, you know, actually, and I won't dive too deep, but there's a really good paper called What Ideas Are Worth by Kevin Hassett. And they did an analysis of like, what are the primary factors driving the economy? And, and you, know, you know, things like improvement in education and increase in capital investment, and a bunch of other factors. And guess what the number one factor was in the 20th century? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was writing down the name of that paper. The no question worry. is- it, Not to put you on the spot. I'm going to say it's innovation, but that's- uh, You got it, you right, got it. It was go. a trick, trick question. Yeah, it wasn't that tricky. I, I figured it wasn't that. that yeah. It was one of those softballs, yeah. So 30 to 40% of economic growth was driven by innovation in the 20th century. What is that in the 21st century? Well north of that. So it's the prime mover of the economy. There's also been some good studies. You probably have heard the debate between kind of intangibles and tangibles. 
And something like 80 to 90% of the value of the S&P 500 is now based in intangibles. Now, part of that is we shifted towards more towards a service economy, but a big part of that is investment in innovation. Um, so it's becoming the prime mover economic growth. There's been a lot of great studies that show that highly innovative companies can take market share, they can deliver uh, higher profit margins, um, they can actually deliver stronger uh, risk adjusted returns. Um, so it's a pretty good academic basis for focusing on this third dimension of innovation. And so I, I think, and I know this was all kicked off with talking about some of the competitors with these crazy long-term targets, but um, to me, that's a sideshow. That's that. I don't want to use the word circus, but maybe I should use the word circus. Feels like a circus to me. We can use it here. Let's use it here. <laughs> um, but it's it's unfortunate because I think most people know in their bones that you know intuitively the innovation is really critically important to growth and uh, ultimately returns and and remaining a leader in any industry. And they really what investors want to do is how do I access that in a risk managed way? Yeah. Because so many of the offerings are are doing what you describe, which is promoting sizzle. What what we're doing is is more grounded, uh, meaning we have it's a criteria driven process. We've talked about eight criteria. Uh, it's very research intensive. So we're not building a basket of ETFs by a marketing organization that's kind of pushing you into robotics or AI or whatever. That, that, that to me is low quality. It's process and research driven with a lot of thoughtfulness around portfolio construction. We haven't hit on that, which is fine, but how you put your portfolio together, we want to have diversity of innovation. So we talked about defining innovation more broadly. We talked about the S curve. We, we try and have balance across kind of three stages on the growth part of the curve, emerging innovators, mid-stage innovators, and then more established innovators. They all can play a role. I mean, you can find large, established, highly profitable businesses that are incredibly innovative. Uh, Microsoft, I think, is a real standout example of that. So I'll kind of pause there, but I think it's a disservice to innovation investing. But I think ultimately what will happen is, you know, we'll get through this bear market, we'll get through this kind of economic environment, we'll come on the other side, and innovation is not stopping. Highly innovative companies continue to launch new products and services and take market share. They'll continue to sustain growth. I happen to, th I mean, one point that I'll pause. What happens when you go into a period of slower growth? It means it's hard to, it's hard to find growth. It's hard to find industries that are, you know, that are driving value creation. And so I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a search for growth. Yeah. And that, that, that natural, you know, Kramer likes to call it, there's always a bull market somewhere, which I think is a great way to describe it, but it's, it's the same dynamic of there's, their investors are, are always in that search for where can I find growth and kind of economic and earnings power and the quality innovators, we've touched on a handful of them, some of the quality cloud software as a service companies, that's a great pond to fish in, biotech, medtech, e-commerce, uh, but you find it in more traditional industries. And, and so we cast a wide net. Um, we don't think innovation is going out of style. Circling back to a previous question, why, why do you find it best to uh, maybe exit in the top of the eighth instead of waiting around to the ninth inning and seeing how the, the game finally settles, right? Like why, why get off the, the train before maturity? Well, first off, I, I always have humility in saying that uh, what I describe from a model point of view is, is hard to do. You know, it's admittedly hard to identify an innovative business or industry early and then ride it for a number of years and get out before maturity. That We're always shooting for the ideal investment. And so, so that is the ideal outcome. The reason you want to exit before maturity or saturation is and you've probably seen growth stocks when they hit a wall. Uh, it's not pretty. Yeah. Um, and usually what happens is you get kind of the double or triple whammy, which is growth slow. So you got to bring your numbers down because, oh, wow, we've, we're saturated the market. And then kind of the more insidious thing is the multiple compression can be quite dramatic. So you get a multiplicative effect 
of growth slowing, numbers coming down on a lower multiple. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of a business that we invested in where we weren't perfect, um, but we we saw that process play out, and that's Roku. Um, you know, we we invested in Roku fairly early. We were following kind of the evolution of TV and realized that you know the, the average consumer was going to start to embrace smart TVs. And this was in 2018, 2018, 2019, well pre-COVID, uh, and identified Roku as you know one of the emerging platforms with a smart TV kind of operating system, had a good ecosystem with TV manufacturers, uh, and just ease of use great brand. So we got in, it went on to be a five, seven, and I think maybe at the peak was close to a 10 bagger. Yeah. Um, obviously everything got accelerated during COVID. So it's one of these kind of unfortunate COVID names, but, uh, but we were in early, uh, you know, we did relatively well with the investment. You know, one of the things I'd say about acceleration adoption is you're, you're accelerating growth, which is good, but also means you're moving up the S curve more quickly. And as we got through COVID and we kind of began to see the reopening, we know kind of what happened. A lot of the COVID stocks pulled back and, and we were impacted by that to some degree. But we were always analyzing the business. And what we saw with Roku was they were perhaps more closer to saturation, particularly in North America. You know, the number of account Roku accounts uh, was something like over 30 million uh, 30, 35 million. And we just, we did the analysis to figure out that they were probably pretty close to saturation with the, just the accounts. And that was something that was going to be a data point that was going to be quite negative. So we exited, um, I think in the one nineties, uh, at a much higher price than where it trades today. Um, so that's a good example. Of, and of course, now we've seen the, the aftermath of that, you know, the, they, they did hit saturation the numbers have come down, the multiples come down and, it's been a been a very difficult ride from from where we sold it. Again, we're not perfect, so I, I want to be pretty humble yeah, about that. I dig, and past performance is not indicative of future results, and anything you hold may go down in the future, and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I think Roku is an interesting example. Um, I uh, it's one it's one that I followed. I'm I'm more inclined. I, I'm the kind of guy that kind of likes to think about it here. I'm not. I'm not sure i'm there on that particular idea but i kind of get more excited after these things blow up a little bit but it's funny uh i've I, david gardner is the guy that i credit for kind of getting me interested in thinking uh forward a lot more and uh i'm really glad that i have because i think it's uh it's expanded my mind in a way that sort of the traditional value 1.0 or value 2.0 I had some blind spots and I, I'm probably still blind. Well, I'm definitely still blind in ways, right? But hopefully less so than I was. Yeah, I mean it's as an investor you it's it's a it's a humble kind of industry because you're always learning things that you don't know. You're always learning, but I think that's what makes it, makes it so exciting as a career is everything under the sun it could potentially impact, you know, your investment and so you have to be kind of hyper aware um, and so what, what we try and do is focus on what I call the big forces. And if you can isolate what are the big forces impacting an industry and a company and then focus your research on those, then I think you can control for a lot. Uh, you can't control for everything. So we, we obviously have tried to encapsulate the big forces within our eight investment criteria. One of the things, Bill, I thought that I don't know whether you're interested or not, but you know, I did learn some pretty interesting things from from my mentor, Frank Sands Sr. And uh, he's had such a huge influence on the investment management industry. I just I just felt compelled to call that out and share a little bit of that. So I love it. One is, you know, we know there's kind of the active versus index or passive debate. And it's an important one because indexing has added a lot of value. But if you're going to be active, you have to be different than the benchmark. And one of the things that my mentor really pioneered, kind of evangelized, is this idea that if you're going to have active management portfolios, own your best ideas. That, that was kind of wisdom point number one. Concentrate in your best ideas. And that can be anywhere from kind of 20 investments up to 30, 35. And 
back in the mid nineties, when I was working with him, he was literally evangelizing this idea of, of concentration. It was very avant-garde, believe it or not. I mean, 30 years later, it's very well accepted. Of course you want to concentrate. That was not the case in the mid or late nineties, um, at least by and large. So I really credit Frank San Senior for really promoting that, particularly on the concentrated growth side. What, interesting enough, from an academic point of view, we're seeing some interesting papers come out that fewer than 5% of investments in the public markets are really driving the vast majority of the returns in the markets. Uh, we, so, so that kind of maybe speaks to the potential, you know, if you concentrate on your best ideas and you can really figure out perhaps some of those companies that can add a lot of value. Yeah. So that's kind of one point of wisdom. There's a couple others I could touch on, but I yeah, let's that. do it. What are they? Um, so a second would be, you know, he used to say, Hey Tom, you know, quality will out. And it was kind of a funny way of saying, you know, over the long term, only invest in quality because, you know, quality leading innovative companies usually win out over the long term. And really what he was saying was, we are wading through the noise of Wall Street. It's just coming at us all the time. And he used to wield his red pen. I mean, I vividly remember Frank Sr. would come in with a Wall Street research report that was just marked all up. You know, he'd cross out the short-term price target. He would circle something and say, this analyst is essentially saying this is like phenomenally great business that's going to grow an above average rate. He's got a neutral on it. You just can't buy it It makes no sense. Yeah, yeah they do that all the time. I love all that. All the time. And it just used to drive him anything that smacked of short-term thinking, he would take his red pen to. Yeah, this is a fantastic opportunity. You just got to wait for XYZ to happen. It's like by the time XYZ happens, the opportunity's gone. It, exactly. It gets discounted and you got to get in there before he used to say you can't be getting there. You know, you can't you can't wait. You got to you got to position yourself now to benefit. But again, the idea is quality will pay off over the long term. And and you got to have independence of thought to analyze that, to identify quality. But th there's a corollary to that, which is low quality also will reveal its nature. So if you dab, if one dabbles in businesses that have been hit hard and maybe are the, the number three in an industry, but they kind of look cheap and attractive, that can be dangerous because if they really are lower quality, um, you know, and they're not competitively positioned, their competitive advantages have eroded. That's not going to be a great long-term investment. It might have a short-term rebound, but probably not a great long-term investment. So I always thought quality will out, you know, quality will win the day, carry the flag of the day. Is I thought was a great uh, lesson. In a different way, you can say uh, having high quality should be a necessary but insufficient condition. Yes, yes. And, and again, that's the thing about investing is you can't focus on one element. You know, this is the ultimate multivariate, you know, uh, endeavor is you really have to align. It's that planet's aligning element. And that's another thing I think that Frank Sands did so well is identifying these classic timeless elements, similar to Poland, uh, but he developed his own really around focusing on leadership and competitive advantage and strong financial strength. These are things that will literally never go out of style. And, you know, I, I was taught these elements uh, and, and saw how they were implemented in the portfolio and, and ultimately, of course, participated in, uh, was quite involved in, in helping to manage those portfolios. Uh, it's great to see that, that play out. Um, you know, maybe another element would be, um, you know, and investing in solutions kind of to big, big problems. Um, you know, we do live in a very difficult kind of geopolitical environment, and it's kind of easy to read the newspaper and get pretty negative. And one of the things I really enjoyed about Frank, and I knew him as Frank, you know, is he was an optimist. He'd come in every day and say, like, what a great world we live in. Like, yeah, there's a ton of bad things going on, but there's a lot of underlying progress. And unfortunately, a lot of that online progress kind of happens slowly. It's like watching paint dry. It doesn't get reported as much on the TV or in the paper. And he always felt that, you know, let's focus on the long-term progress. And, you know, if you ever find a company that offers a big solution to a big problem, boy, that's a great investment. And I, I distinctly remember, well, I think in the first days that I joined Sands Capital, 
uh, pharmaceutical stocks were, were very much out of favor. There was potential legislation that was kind of attacking the industry. And he took a very principled view that, you know, while the pharmaceutical industry is not perfect, um, you know, it, it's an industry that has created so many great treatments for difficult diseases. It's doing really important work. It's a part of the overall solution. And he dug his heels in and stuck with his pharmaceutical investments. He even wrote a letter to his clients explaining, we are not selling these drug companies. They're down significantly. Um, I think they're going to they're gonna come through this and do just fine. And of course, we know how that played out. Of course, the pharmaceutical industry continued to grow and innovate. So, you know, kind of investing in companies that are actually developing you know, real solutions, you know, I think was, was something that he taught me. And that's kind of important when the stocks are out of favor. It's like, it's like my take on Monsanto. I mean, I know Monsanto has done some bad in the world. I'm not trying to trivialize that, but they also feed a lot of people that would otherwise not have food. That's the original green revolution actually is, yeah. um, you know, increasing farm yields. And, you know, we saw the the reverse of that, I think it was in Sri Lanka recently where they, I think they dabbled in moving away from some of those technologies, whether it was fertilizer or some of the, the GM seeds. And, you know, people died as a result of that. Yeah, so, it's like real uh, consequences. There, 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 can be, there can be consequences. So, I mean, What do we have again, for four and five from Frank? We're through three well, of them. Yeah, let's see. Um, you know, one of them is uh, aim for the long-term viewpoint. You know, j- just this idea that, he always felt that Wall Street was so short-term focused that it seemed like their time horizon was six to 12 months. And we kind of know it, it usually is. And, you know, a lot of the great opportunities from an investment point of view play out over five years or 10 years. And again, I talked about his famous red pen. I, I distinctly remember him marking up a Microsoft research report that I think it downgraded Microsoft. And he kind of chuckled and said, we're just beginning this process. I mean, you probably know the famous quote, you know, their their mission was to put a, a computer on every desk and in every home. And he's like, Tom, how far through that process do you think we are? And this is like the mid nineties. Yeah. Like, well, we got, all, we, we're really early. He's like, that's right, Tom. We're really early. So does it really matter that there's some short-term headwind of the company in the next six months? It doesn't matter at all. And that really, you know, that really stuck with me. So aim for the long-term viewpoint. And that, that means measured in years, maybe even a decade. What's going to happen five, 10 years from now? And always keep that front and center. One of the other things that he focused on, I think it's the fifth one is, um, you know, it, whenever you would give a presentation to a client or prospective client, he'd say, and I, I, this is brilliant. Bas- it's very basic, but very brilliant is the secret to stock price appreciation is long-term growth and earnings power that there's a correlation if a business can grow earnings power over the long term, and of course it has to be done in a quality, sustainable manner, that, that that ought to push up the stock price over time. And one of the things he used to do is say, well, let's figure out what's driving that growth. And so he was used to like to ask the question, what is really special about your company? If you couldn't tell him what was really special, he wasn't interested. But if if you lit up and said, Frank, this company has this really critical new product or service or technology uh, that I think is going to play out over many years, and they're just really dominant. And they've got all these competitive advantages. He got really interested. Huh. Uh, and he used to say, stick with that. Focus on the essence of that business, what, what makes it special. And the next time that the stock sells off, refocus on, on what makes that company special really dive into that and then hold on to that. And um, and so, you know, we have younger analysts that would join the team. He, he would always kind of try and focus on kind of the key drivers, you know, what made the company special and then encouraging them to kind of look, again, look further out, have that long-term lens. Um, and, you know, we've obviously we tried to carry some of these lessons forward as we focus on innovation and, you know, the evolutionary lens that that we've developed is looking out at kind of these long-term structural changes in industries, looking out over over a decade. Um, but I, I'm just so appreciative of having been able to work closely with Frank Sansiner and, and really the whole team over there at that at that great firm. 
Well, I'm appreciative for you sharing those five uh, tidbits because uh, I think focusing on what it sounds like Frank taught you how to focus on, um, you know, there I would be lying if I said that there wasn't part of me that wonders how much of the outperformance of the strategy is somewhat interest rate related. But then there's the other part of me, right? Interest rates going down. So you get a little bit of uh, excess benefit. The other part of me thinks that it's the way the world should work. Uh, that when you, regardless of the, perhaps interest rates have helped, right? That, that, can, that can be true and it can still be the right strategy, right? Both those statements can be true. And I am, I'm as certain as I can be on anything. So at this point, let's call it 65%, um, but really it's 75 or 80 uh, that long terms are long term earnings power really is the answer, right? And focusing on the basket of businesses that I think really do have uh, disciplined ways to increase long terms long term earnings power, I think is a much much safer game uh, for my brain than trying to figure out like, boy, this is the fourth best player, but it's so cheap and it can re-rate and then I can get out and then I can go find the next fourth best player. Like that it's just not a game that I think I'm going to be, I don't even know that I want to live that way to be perfectly honest. And anyone that does, I'm not trying to like say, don't, I mean, good for you. You got to do what, what works for you. Right. Let, let me build on your comment about, you know, that you can, you can have a dynamic where there's macro headwinds, whether it's perhaps rising rates and inflation. These are real. We don't want to ignore them. But that if you have a business that is clearly innovative and growing and improving margins and sustaining growth and growing that earnings power, that can get rewarded. You know, maybe your return isn't as high, but it's probably above average potentially. Again, if the company delivers. Um, one of the things, and I, I kind of come back to Frank Sand Senior, but one of the things he would say is, as an analyst, don't focus on the things that are unpredictable. And unknowable. And he's and he's a kind of a classic bottom-up investor, meaning he's very company focused and fundamentals at kind of that more business and industry level versus top-down and more macro. And, and his viewpoint was very few people really know how the economy is going to play out over the next year. I mean, we're debating whether we have a recession or not. Um, I don't know if very many people predicted the depth of the bear market that we're in right now whether it's the market or the economy, these are fairly unpredictable things in the short term. You do know over longer time periods that there's generally a growing economic backdrop. So you can kind of control for that with a longer time horizon. And so rather than wrapping your mind around the economy and the macro, which again, we're not ignoring, but spend more of your time on finding these really great businesses that meet a set of criteria, hopefully ones that can kind of help navigate through a difficult environment. And one of the things perhaps that's, um, I don't know, a bit frustrating right now is, you know, we, we own innovative businesses, again, that we think are high quality. They're generally growing at pretty healthy rates, you know, whether that's 25, 30% or so, generally stable to improving margins. Um, so they're pretty healthy. Um, and as we go into a recessionary-like environment, whatever that looks like, shallow or not shallow or short or long, um, I would think that innovative businesses, truly innovative companies, should be able to grow on average through that environment. And again, investors are kind of always searching for where's the growth. And I think innovative companies, particularly the quality ones, I, th I think are well positioned, again, at least over the longer term. But again, trying to predict or time the market or the economy feels a bit like a fool's game. And one tends to zig when they should be zagging. You know, I think one of the things that value investors do that I think is smart is maybe take advantage of that. You know, when Mr. Market is selling off these high quality businesses or assets, um, being patient and looking for that window of opportunity. So we, we do also apply elements of that. I mean, we follow a lot of innovative companies where maybe they meet the first seven criteria. They're attractive industries and high quality companies and all of that. 
but the return doesn't really meet our hurdle, we'll just put it on the shelf and follow it. And then we'll maybe identify, here's a range that if it comes down to that range, perhaps we'll take advantage of that. So it's kind of putting a bit of that value orientation to work. Um, patience is really important in what we do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I've, I've noticed that from, uh, listening to you, uh, and, and obviously this conversation, but it strikes me as a, uh, research and watch and wait and then pounce, uh, approach, which, uh, I think is pretty cool. And it's gotta be fun to research innovation every day. It's gotta be something that's exciting to get up and, uh, be able to do, right. It's not like, uh, I don't know. It's not watching paint dry for, for lack of a better term. You get to live yeah. in some in- exciting stuff. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, when, there's a famous quote that says something like, um, you know, the, the future is already here. It's just not broadly distributed. And William Gibson or some science fiction writer, I think, had that had that interesting quote. And it's so true that if you're doing innovation investing well, hopefully you're identifying these important innovations that have, again, passed the technical hurdle, the economic business model hurdle, are kind of on the cusp of going mainstream. And if you've done your work well, you, hopefully you are seeing the future play out. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. We were attending the Gartner IT Security Conference back in 2018. And um, one of our analysts on our team identified that IT security was going to shift away from kind of firewalls and perimeter-based IT security over to the cloud and identified Zscaler as an investment really early. It was a four to five billion market cap. Uh, we obviously dug in and talked to CISOs and a bunch of other users and did that that work you were describing. And we got in early and and ultimately did well. But it was like we saw like, wow, this this is where the industry is headed and this is the pioneer. And they were tested. We talk about that mode attack. There were some pretty big IT security companies that were kind of caught flat foot. They didn't have the alternative to the the investment that we invested in. Another example right now in the biotech area is, I mean, to me, we live in the golden age of biotech, uh, meaning we're kind of moving away from just basic replacement proteins or biologics, think like insulin, which is still important. And we're now moving into a world where we can modulate gene expression with RNAi technology. We can insert genes in the cells using gene therapy. Uh, eventually we'll get to a point where we can edit genes. That's called gene editing. That's different than gene therapy. Um, we're analyzing companies where we're seeing clinical data come back, whether it's phase two or phase three data, that at least in, in our assessment appear to be kind of next generation technologies. Um, and I think gene therapy in particular, I think we're gonna see a number of new gene therapy approvals as we go into 2023. Again, the idea of putting in a therapeutic gene into cells, not editing, but just putting in that gene, uh, delivered using a viral vector um, and deliver much improved efficacy with with good safety. We're seeing, I call it the innovation frontier, this idea that if you're doing innovation well, hopefully you're kind of getting up to that, that frontier within an industry of where innovation is happening and you're identifying the next generation product or service, again, it's going mainstream, and then you're getting in hopefully early on that, that adoption curve. So that's so much of what we're kind of structured to do. Again, humility, um, you know, it, it's not, not every investment is going to work out. Um, you do a lot of things to kind of increase the probabilities, hopefully reduce risk, as we talked about, again, the eight criteria of the process. But living living on that innovation frontier, whether that's in technology or life sciences, is very exciting. And hopefully it keeps you positive while there's a storm going on with the bear market and everything going on in, in the world. But uh, as Frank Sr. used to say, you know, there's a lot of progress in the world and, and stay focused on that. Yeah. Well, Frank sounds like he was a good dude. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that. He's probably a great man is what I, how I should say it, but, uh, I appreciate you passing it on. Um, and thank you, you know, for this conversation, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I find myself uplifted after it. Uh, you know, some like my man, uh, Jem Carson, I had the 
I had to go cry after that one. This one I'm I'm oh feeling like good about. Uh, no, I didn't actually cry, but I did want a stiff bourbon. Um, <laughs> the uh, you know, if people liked what we talked about, uh, how 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 should they find you? How uh, where do you guys write? Where do you publish your stuff? All that stuff. Yeah, Bill. Thanks for asking about that. Um, we do have a blog uh, that people can subscribe to. So if you go to evolutionarytree.com. Uh, you look under insights, there's a little drop down menu. There's a blog library so you can read. You can read the five points of wisdom by Frank San, uh, that, that are my recollect, recollections about things I learned from Frank San Senior, but a whole bunch of other topics that we write about. We have thought pieces. Um, again, you can subscribe to the blog. We participate in, in high quality podcasts such as yours. And um, obviously, we'd love to hear from anyone. You can send us an email or reach out to us. But, you know, Bill, I really appreciate you, um, you know, offering to kind of hear our story and and listen to kind of how we do innovation investing and focus on quality innovation and doing it in a risk managed way. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, hopefully for sure. Shout out, out bear to, market. <laughs> shout out to uh, Jonathan for, uh, yeah, I get a lot of inbounds and uh, his, I was like, you know what, I might be down to interview this guy. And then I started reading and I said, let's do it. So, Well, I'm glad that you were interested in me and I was interested in you. And uh, I'm glad that we could do this. This was fun. So uh, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it very much. All right. Take care of yourself. And, uh, you know, come on anytime. We uh, the listeners need to know what's going on in innovation. Sounds good. Will do. All right. Take care.